you are listening to itrboxing.com radio with your host lukey okay i'm gonna do your intro um i'm on with probably one of the most interesting people uh probably one of the people i binge watch on youtube listening to quotes from the most uh billy briscoe how goes it i'm good how about yourself well, I mean, I think I'm I'm keeping a positive attitude. I'm reading a book a week, but the world's kind of uh, different right now, so I'm just trying to be very optimistic. Yeah, I feel you. Same here. But my way of staying busy is uh, talking to people in boxing and recording them and putting them on the YouTubes of people I just find interesting. So the fans might not – it might not be the biggest names, but these are people that I think are interesting and I've wanted to talk to you. For a long time. You've just been on my bucket list of people to talk to. So I'm excited to do this. Good to hear. Good to hear. Okay, so I want to start with, you have a quote in an interview where you said, nothing, like in boxing, like in life, nothing that's ever meaningful. I'm going to summarize it, but basically it just doesn't happen overnight. And that was an impactful quote to me. Can you talk about your process when training a fighter and not expecting something too quickly about having to go through the process of getting to um, the fighter, the the best version of that fighter. Well, you know, it takes time. You know, you got to cultivate. You got to cultivate a fighter. If you start him from the ground up, you know, it takes a lot of years. And you build a fighter basically like you build a house from the ground up. The stronger the foundation, the stronger the building you can put on it. The square the foundation, the easier everything goes in behind it. And um, same thing with a fighter. You know, if you build them solid, you build solid fundamentals, which takes time, you know, repetition, repetition, and more repetition. And, um, you know, you get a good end result. And what what kind of brought you into training? I heard a little bit of your background, but what really got you in? And did you have like an apprenticeship in your own mind of being a boxing trainer before you felt comfortable being a trainer? I, 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 uh, I started, my father started me training when I was six years old. And then he passed away when I was seven, man, rest in peace. And then my mother took me to the gym and I never really left. So, yeah, I definitely did that apprenticeship. I studied under my mentor, the late great Mr. Wesley Moza, the guy was a soul, was perhaps one of the greatest professional boxing teachers that ever lived. And then if you go off of a uh, martial arts lineage, like, you know, how you study for master... Wong, who studied for Master Wu, who studied for Master Lee, who was the creator of the system, right? Well, I studied from the great Mr. Wesley Mozart, my guy, Mr. Soul, who studied from Mr. Jack Blackburn, who studied from the great, who studied under the great Mr. Jack Blackburn. So, you know, that makes me like a third generation student. That's, so there's a lineage. Yes, sir. Do you take pride in that? Absolutely. Very few people can trace their lineage back that far. That's That's interesting. So when you started working with fighters, was your goal to have a pro fighter or were you just – your goal was just to create good boxers who would, would perform well in society and would have skills in the ring? Well, no, I was always training professionals. When I, uh, when I was about 15 – see, my eyes are bad. I can't – you know, I got – without glasses, I can't see straight, you know. And uh, I was having problems fighting for the trainer that, that was, was helping me. They wanted me to stay in the gym, so what they did was they had me start helping train fighters. So I was working with the amateurs in the gym. And then they had a few, like, prelim guys, four- and six-round professionals. I started working with them. And uh, I worked my first professional fight when I was 13 years old. And what were you doing? Were you, like, the mitt guy? Were you the guy that's observing them hit the bag? Are you the guy that's uh, that the pro hates because you're saying keep your hand up when you're throwing punches, shadow boxing? What was the capacity of that role? Did it all. So just everything. You just found a way to – you you did every single aspect. Well, you got to understand, by the time I started helping uh, – I started as an apprentice as, a, as an apprentice trainer – or apprentice teacher, excuse me. Trainers uh, – we, we're not trainers, we're teachers. As an apprentice teacher, I've already been in the gym eight years, nine years, you know what I'm saying? So I already understood. I've already had numerous amateur fights and I was doing certain things. So – you know the uh, the trainers wanted me to to help them train the fighters, and it was it was pretty natural to be honest with you. Okay, has there when you go when you grow up doing something for so long, it's like second nature. No, I under, I understand that completely. Um, 
Has there ever been a fighter you worked with that at first, I don't want to use the word intimidating, but you, you knew you had to be on your A game? No. Never? No. Because, you know, training fighters comes back to Like, I never felt intimidated training for nah. Okay, I'm just curious because, like, I always, like, I always think about, like, the human – because we are human beings. Every now and then there's, like, that kind of, like hu- – because, like, I, I get scared talking to some girls. Like, I'm like, oh, my God, this girl's too cute. I always wonder if there's I hated some – I hate it working with – well, I, lo- I love Bert Cooper. May rest in peace. But I hate it working with him because when he hits you in the pads, he damn near rip your arms out to suck. The shoulder? It would, it would like, okay. hurt your shoulders? He was one of the, he was a, one of the most murderous punches I've ever held pads with in my life. This guy, he – he, he punched a whole full brick wall. Jeez, Louise. Um, so, like, as you start working with fighters, what are some gym stories? Just like the, because every day you're in the gym, you're grinding. It's super constructive. It's fun, but it's also a little monotonous. There has to be a couple of stories that stand out from this era to you. Uh, you know, it's always you know, training fighters is is, is you know. Pretty much the same thing, man, you know. But you can't train every fighter the same. See, that's what uh, a lot of guys make mistakes. Yeah, it's not the cookie-cutter approach, you know. You can't train all fighters the same. You can show them all the same thing, but they're going to do, uh, they're going to do a slightly different. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It's right for the individual. You take two twins, come out their mind moments apart, trained by the same person, same amount of time, same amount of sparring session, then the same amount of amateur fights, whatever, whatever. And you look at them, they both fight slightly different. One's usually more of a boxer, one's usually more of a puncher, you know. So when you're training guys, you just got to find out what works for them because what's food for one fighter is poison for another. And sometimes you got to learn how to trick a fighter. Talk about but that. I want to I want to learn about that. Fighter. Some fighters that um, I don't want to say are lazy because I won't work with a lazy fighter, but let's say he's, he's he's got a little laziness in him for that day, per se. You got to trick him into doing a little bit more than he wants to. And then you got some fighters that are over... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Over enthusiastic, and they they, they want to train too much. Because most real fighters that are green or in the, still in the developmental stage will overtrain out of insecurity, not training hard enough. And then a lot of green trainers will overtrain a guy out of insecurity, not training hard enough. Makes for a real bad combination. You can't burn a guy out. You know, you got to take him to a peak. A fighter like a pyramid. You want to get him to that point, then everything else is downhill. So you gotta, you know, you gotta trick him into doing a little bit less than he wants to do. How long did it take for you to know the kind of the way to peak a fighter? And did you have to observe other people not doing that? Because that's an interesting observation. Well, it takes years, man. It's, 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 like, uh, it's like when I was a kid and I was trying to learn how to finish concrete. I worked on a crew and I was asking this guy, Yo, how, how, how did you get that so, you know, so level without, you know, without, without a, a level just was screening? He said, it's all in the eye, son. And that's what it is. It's revolved in boxing. It's all in the eye. You know, because different fighters peak at different times. You know, you got to peak them at the right time. So you got to know, you know, how to bring that fighter to that peak at the right time. Because if he peaks too soon, it's no good. If he peaks too late, it's no good. You got to peak right on fight night, you know. Well, I'll make and a that fight is different. I'll make a boring example. And my boring example is I, I for a while, I, I liked with, lifting heavy weights. And in order right. to get to that prime number you have to wait three days so it's counterintuitive you only get to lift three or four days a week at most but that's how you optimize and for me it was like counterintuitive being someone that had been athletic my whole life to train less to get more sometimes less is more because rest and recovery is a forgotten element of training if you don't make time for rest and recovery make time for losing because it's coming and it's bringing friends so i'm gonna i'm gonna uh make a crazy uh, kind of statement, but as Americans, I think it's hard for us to rest because our culture is based around go, go, go innovation being at the top of the food chain. And I think it's like that rest and recovery is so hard to get across, even if you understand that it's important. That's true. But you know, um, like you were talking about with the weights or with boxing or anything for that matter, you don't get stronger when you train, you get stronger when you rest and recover. So, you know, you have to explain that to a fighter. You have to let him know. You know, what you're doing now is you're breaking the body down. You're making micro tears and whatnot into the, you know, into the muscles. And, and you know, you got to give it time to recover, you know. A fighter, sometimes, you know, you get a guy in the gym and he's looking good. You tell him, go get lost for three days. He looks at you like you're nuts. Do me a favor, man. Just go get lost for three days. 
You really want him to get lost for two days, but you know if you're here for three, you can get two. Another way of tricking a fighter. You know what I mean? I, I, li- I like this. Don't is, peak too soon and leave it in the gym where it doesn't mean anything. I just I, I like these nuances. I like the 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 idea, the concepts that you've been doing this for so long. You know that overshooting a number will get you probably the number you're looking for. Absolutely, it's human nature. You know what I mean. So who are some you know, of the pro you fighters? You exploit human nature in this game. You got to like you know, a being you fight and I pull your hand down. What's the first thing you want to do? Lift it up so then I hit you around the side. If I pull it up, what's the first thing you want to do? Bring it down so I loop over top. You know, I grab your arm and I pull it under. What's the first thing you want to do? Pull it in so I let you pull it and I follow you home with the right hand. Things like that. You got to learn how to exploit human nature. Man, there's so many different questions I can ask. But let's go Let's go to some of the pro fighters you're working with right now. Or were working before guys. COVID. I only got a few guys I could talk about because yeah. I shadow train a lot of guys, you know, which, uh, which I can't speak about because I signed non-disclosure agreements and whatnot. That's fine. We're all about you making money, so you don't got to jeopardize your money or anything, but just talk about the guys you can. Well, I got a few different guys. I got a, right now I got a, I got this kid, uh, he just turned pro with Danny Garcia. You know, I, I, I'm Danny Garcia's cut man, so, you know, they got me training. Um, They got me training one of his prospects. He looked good. He won his pro debut, stopped the guy. Okay. In the second round. And, uh I'm working with my son, he's getting it together, you know what I mean? The kids uh you know, he he's he's definitely gonna be a hot prospect, you know what I mean? He's just uh he's still developing, you know, he's still getting where he wants to we were told he's like five eleven for like one forty, kids big. How is big that one. training your son? Like that that it's seems hard. yeah it's hard. Father and son. See, when I was a kid, I used to see it all the time. You know, I used to be in a locker room and we'd be changing and we about to go sport. and the father would come in and tell his son something and then they start fucking arguing. I don't know, man, maybe he slapped him upside the head. I mean, it was crazy, right? So I don't know, you know, boom. And then, you know, I always seen it in many different instances in various gyms throughout the world that I've been to, but I never fully understood it until I actually experienced it for myself. You're going to look at most fathers fall into one of two categories when it comes to training their son. They're either too brave with their son's blood I think he should be able to fight King Kong, Godzilla, and Loch Ness Monster and beat shit down his leg. I scream, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. And beat the hell out of the guy. Or, oh, you, you ain't killing it. You know, he grinds his son up. And then he got the other one in the category, which I kind of fall into, which is a little too scary, Mary, with their blood because, you know, you've been there and you've done that. I've been training professional fighters for 31 years. I've been in attendance with three fighters, passed away, you know, while working different fights. You know, I've seen many guys banged up. I'm from Philadelphia, so I know. And I came up in the era where a lot of the fighters were still, you know, in the gym. And they were on their heels, you know, with slurred speech and whatnot. And I always said to myself, damn, I don't want me or none of my guys to ever wind up like that. So, you know, always try to air a little more on the side of caution, you know. I mean, that's, I, I just think about, I'm one of the only people to video uh, videotape and do a little feature on Max Dobyshev. Before he passed away, and when he passed away, that, I was hit, there that night. which one? I was there that night when he fought. Yeah, and it's like when that ha- that I happened. Dusty, I was working the cuts with Dusty Harrison on the undercard. That one really, really uh, hurt, and it made me wonder if I loved boxing or why did I love boxing? And for uh, you, you know, you gotta love boxing, man. I mean, yep. we, we know what we sign up for subconsciously. We know the rest that we we that, that we take, you know. We know, but, you know, it's a, it's, it's a shame. You don't want to see nobody get hurt, you know what I mean? Like, you want to hurt a guy enough in a fight that he can't continue that night, but hopefully after the fight, go home to his family with maybe a couple, you know, uh, a couple little bruises, scrapes, and scratches, maybe a cut here and there, and that's that. You don't want to see nobody get seriously hurt. You know, when I was a kid, Joe Frazier used to come in the gym and used to tell us, he said, this is the only sport you get your brain shook, your name, your brain shook, your money took, and your name in the Undertaker's book, you know? And they said Ali was the poet. Ah, but his shit was real. And then Joe Frazier always used to take when we was kids, he'd come in and he'd show us something. We all, he'd bring us around, start showing us how to like, turn that fuck over on the bag and this and that. And he always used to tell us it's better to hurt in the gym than hurt in the fight. Rules to live by. So can I make a, a bold claim and you can tell me I'm crazy? Is sure, why not? Danny Garcia's left hook the lineage of Joe Frazier's? Nah, I mean, you know, if it's Philadelphia left hook, I mean, 
this city here, I, I, you know, I've trained fighters all over the world. I've been blessed to be all over the world in different parts of the country. And, uh, you know, Philadelphia is more of a left hook city. You know, it's it's just a culture. But Danny had a hell of a left hook for uh, for the for the welterweight division. I mean, I've held pads for a lot of guys that were much heavier than him that didn't have half his heart. Does he leverage it with his head? Because to me, technically speaking, it looks like he throws it, but he throws his head down to get a little extra torque. Nah, that's more. That's his setup. See, what he does is, it, it's, people think that they, they call that the no-look left hook, right? You know how they say he does. He mm-hmm. doesn't look any farther. But he trains that. And now, be it though, it might not, it's far from textbook and it's unorthodox. But if you train anything long enough, it becomes effective. And then you have to look at, like, with uh, Bruce Lee, when he, well, with his system of Jeet Kune Do, the way of the intercepting fist, he said a good Jeet Kune Do man is unorthodox in his approach because the unorthodox moves are hard to counter. Well, in order to counter something, you have to get away from it first. So if you break it down to its lowest element, unorthodox moves are hard to get away from. You know, you train for the jab, straight right hand, left hook, fundamentally. You don't train for for a shot that looks like it's coming in the, at the 45 that the body lands and left hook up top, you know? No, I is so like and some, some, some guys think that oh, I can read his eyes. Well, you can't read his eyes if he's showing you the top of his head, right? Hard so to read. what you're but saying, you know it's coming. But here's the thing: you just don't know when it's coming. It the fact that it's so unpredictable that it's so uh, that you can't get a guy to come in and spar with that same um, movement as well as him, and you just have to be on fight night and have to assume that you can guess when he's going to do it. Yeah, you know what's coming. You just don't know when. That's always... He's, he's got a much better boxing IQ than people give him credit for. The guy can really fight. I mean, you know, if people want to say certain things and this, that, that's fine. But if you look at it at his track record at 140, I mean, he, he, beat, he beat the best. You know, his resume, he fought 13 world champions. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, definitely. He kicked the fight his ass off. Well, he's not a kid no more. I knew since he was a kid. The man can fight his ass off. You know what I'm saying? He knows what he's doing. He's got a good IQ. It's not pretty, but it's effective. You know what I mean? So I've got a question. Philly always feels like the East Coast version of where I'm from. I'm from the Bay Area. And yeah. like you you feel like our East Coast sibling. And in the Bay Area, we kinda I kind of equate it to Philly like this too. We've had some legendary fighters, but we have a ton of good fighters, but they never really make it outside of one or two. And I kind of see that in Philly where you got a couple of good fighters, but you really have like 40 or 50 good guys out there, but they never quite get that national exposure. Now, this last year, that kind of changed with Julian, Tevin, uh, Stephen Fulton, Danny. There were a lot of guys on the radar, but I'd always wondered why Philly never really broke through on the major stage with a lot of world champions at one time. I believe Philadelphia got 43 world champions. And our first world champion was Danny Dockery, bantamweight champion in the world in 1901. New York didn't have their first world champion. It was Benny Leonard in uh, lightweight 1920s. But um, there's a lot, of, a lot of world champions in Philadelphia. But the thing was, you know, if you go back to like the 70s, Philadelphia cornered the market. There was like the top 10 middleweights in the world. Philadelphia had like five of them, you know, five of the top 10 world-rated middleweights was here in Philadelphia. And then if you go back to the 40s, maybe t- – Five of the top ten lightweights was in 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 the city. Like my mentor, the really great Mr. Wesley Mozart, Bob Montgomery, Ike Williams from Trent, but he really trained in Philadelphia. Ike Williams, Lou Jenkins from Texas, he was here in Philadelphia. I mean, he had a lot of a lot of good fighters, you know. But uh, unfortunately, and I, I you know I'm probably gonna make some enemies by saying this, but it's true. Philadelphia suffers from a lack of good management and good promotion. They don't put the money behind the fighter the way they should. You look at some of the guys that have equal talent in New York per se, but they have that money behind them. They got that New York money behind them and they get moved right correctly, you know, slow, slow and steady winter race like the parable taught us. So they get there, boom, they become champion. Then you got guys in Philadelphia of equal talent or maybe slightly better. Don't get there because they was rushed too soon, put in the wrong fights, you know, because it takes money to move fighters. And a lot of these guys here in the city don't really want to put no money into a guy. So you think it's kind of like the age-old boxing kind of sad part of the business where if uh, big money is offered to a good fighter before they're ready, take the fight, and then it could derail the whole career. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it happens all the time in Philadelphia. And then the thing is, let's say you're 11-0 and and I'm 9-0, and right? And we're both from here in Philadelphia. 
a local promoter will want us to fight a ten or eight or ten round fight on his card, and we'll both get like I don't know twenty five hundred dollars a piece, three grand a piece maybe, right? To beat the hell out of each other, and now we both got blemishes on record. And unfortunately, in today's like, today's day and age of boxing, you know, you get a little blemish and it sets you back. Which back in the day it didn't because they realized you learn more from a good loss than you do from bad wins. And yeah, certain people tell you there's no such thing as a bad win, but there is. If you're beating 25 gimmies that you know you could beat, and then they saw you win tough, you know, you go from the from being a shark in a guppy pool to being a guppy in the ocean. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, a whole yeah. other ball game when you go hunting and a rabbit got a gun too. Yeah. And you get up there and then you get exposed. You know, you get they put you in an acid test and you and and you whittle away. Because the other guy you fought, he might be 18 and 3, but this son of a bitch fought, you know, 21 killers and was able to beat 18 of them, you know? And I think that the thing I look at, because I go super box rec nerd guy and look up fighters and watch fights, is some of these guys just look at records of opponents. But some of these opponents, even with bad records, can beat some of these undefeated fighters or are really tough fights. And Absolutely. I, I've been noticing that lately that a lot of guys have been taking guys lightly. And I think when this COVID-19 leaves, I think we're going to see more fighters miss weight and more fighters get upset than ever because I don't think a lot of people are staying disciplined or training through this thing, which I can understand. Or the gym to close down, you know what I mean? Not not too many people have gyms in their house. Yep. I mean, you can go out and do your road work. Running and sparring is the two best conditioners, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, if you're not in a gym, you can't really blame them, you know, because you, you, you know, it's like if you don't go to work for six months and then paint houses, then you come back and you're a little rusty. Is it, is it your fault or is it lack of inactivity? You know what I mean? There's a great Sugar Ray Robinson said, "Activity is the key to this thing. You gotta stay active." You know, the great Ray ourselves trained 23 world champions said, "The rest is the rust." You know, you can't really blame them. I mean, you could be the most disciplined individual in the world. What, what are you going to do? A thousand sit-ups, 200 push-ups, and, and run? But, and maybe shadow box five hard rounds. But at the end of the day, you know, you're not sparring, you're not in the bag. It's, it's kind of difficult. You almost got to give them a pass on it. How do you see boxing, like not, not from the business side, but when from the fight side, how do you see the fights looking from fighters making weight to the pace of the fights? How do you think they're going to look when people come back from this break? That'd be fine. I mean, they should be okay. Most fighters blow up 20 pounds between fights anyway. You know? Like, when you fight in the middleweight, you're not fighting the middleweight. You find a guy that's damn near over light heavyweight because he'll weigh in at 160 and they blow back up to 175, 176 the next day. You know? Nobody fights in a traditional weight class like they used to back in the day when they had same-day weigh-ins. You know, nobody does that no more. I won't, I won't say who, but I was with a fighter... Um, filming, and I watched him cut 22 pounds in the morning not, of a weigh-in. Sure. Them guys do it all the time. MMA guys do more than that. I take my hat off to them. You know, them, 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 them dudes, man, they cut 40, 45 pounds. Yeah, that's... Have you ever worked with an MMA guy? Sure. I work with Paul Felder. He's in the UFC now. Work with a few other guys. What's that like? It's good. You gotta be slightly different. You gotta, you gotta, uh, you gotta adjust the style for... To suit MMA, you can't can't fight off the half man. You can't, you know, you gotta fight out of a little more of a square position. You gotta be a little lighter on the lead leg so you can check kicks, and a little square so you can um sprawl, sprawl when they go for the shoot. Yeah, this is good though. To me, Some guys work hard. They work hard. You seem very open minded. Um, does it kind of teach you some things to also apply to boxing because you have to kind of get creative a bit with an MMA fighter. No, nah, not really, because the thing that applied to MMA wasn't working boxing, you know. And then, like, a, for example, if we was using, you know, a, a MMA guy, you got to make a fight square more. So, you know, he's able to check kicks and, and, and sprawl. You do that in a, in a boxing ring, a guy to fight you off the half man, but you know, he's going to pick you apart because you're too square. And when you're too square, you're doing one of two things. You make yourself more of a target defensively, and you're cheating the rotation on your punches offensively. So, you know, let's just say, you, you know, you're cheating the rotation of right hand. So... If you cheat the rotation of a hand, you cheat the rotation of a left hook and everything else to come behind it because every punch of boxing comes off the one in front of it. But in there, they can't really, you know, they can't really sit there off the half man, lead leg, you know, sit, plant their feet and turn because they have more to worry about. They got to worry about getting leg kicked. They got to worry about, you know, maybe the guy faints them and they throw the hook and they go underneath and double leg them. The quickest way into a double leg is under a bad left hook, you know, so you got to, 
you know, it's a different, different, different world. I've always wondered, um, you, you cornered, uh, Gabe Brazado when he fought Golovkin and that was kind of viewed as the best version of Golovkin. You made it from the ground up. And you made a decision in that fight to stop it. And I think that was the mm-hmm. the right decision. Can you talk about – because like a lot of people in hindsight can say they were going to do it. But that takes a lot of courage to stop an HBO fight for um, on that magnitude. Can you talk about kind of that moment and leading up well, to Well, you it? have to care about the fighter, man. If you don't care about the fighter, you're, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. You got to really care about the fighters you work with. I built Gabby from the ground up the first day he walked in the gym at 18 to 11 amateur fights, and I took him to the world title. You know, now we were number one in the world in the IBF at 154. But, you know, the people that conducting the business for him convinced him that, you know, not to wait around and to move up to fight, um, to fight Golovkin. So he went up before Golovkin. I wanted to wait. I wanted to stay at 54 and... And, you know, win the, the, the title at 154 junior middle and then, you know, see where that took us. And then maybe a year or two down the road, we could have went up to 60. You know, he went and gave his best effort, but he wasn't a, he wasn't a middleweight at that time. We weighed in slightly over 165, I think it was. You're only going to gain five pounds for a middleweight fight because his it, it body wasn't used to that. His body was still used to being at 54. But to answer your question, I stopped it because, you know, I care about the fighters. I care about all fighters. You know what I mean? I might not even work with a fighter a day in my life, but if I'm in charge of working with that fighter, I have to take his best interest in the heart. And, you know, you don't want to see nobody get hurt. You'd rather stop the fight a few punches too soon than one too late. But this is the hurt business. People, you know, every professional fight that you're ever in, you're going to leave a little piece of yourself. But in some fights, you can lose, you can lose, you know, lose your whole career in one night. You can lose your your sight, like Israel Vasquez, man. You know, you can lose. You know, you can lose your your functioning as a person, like the great Joe McCullum, the G man. You, you can lose your life. I mean, anything can happen. You know, this is the hurt business. So you know, you gotta really care about the fight and err on the side of caution. Was it a hard decision for me? Yeah, it was a hard decision because you know he, he we worked so hard to get him there, but. It wasn't hard enough for me to allow him to um, to take any unnecessary punishment. And to be fair, Gabe did about as good as he could have done. He he showed yeah. aspects of Golovkin's weakness. It's just the size was too much. I don't know if it was the size. See, my opinion on that was we you know we had the right game plan, but he got cut. And when he got cut, the guy that we had working with us for some reason that day he just couldn't keep it. Couldn't keep the eye cut. Couldn't keep the blood stopped. You know, so my man couldn't see. Now, if a man can't see, you know, a man can't fight because the one you don't see coming, the one that gets you. If you don't see none of them, they're all going to get you. So, you know, Golovkin was able to hit him with a few shots he didn't see coming. He didn't get him. But I wasn't going to let that happen because it's like water on a rock. You know, eventually enough water to eat a whole rifle of rock. So you can't let that happen. What's the fight? you remember from camp to fight night, you remember the most of your career so far? I've worked a lot of fights, man. But there's not a memorable one? There's not one that brings like a, that you rub your chin and you go, man, that was that was pretty cool. I've worked thousands and thousands of professional fights since I'm 15 years old. I'm 32 years straight I've been working, you know what I'm saying? I've, I've been all over the world, I, you know, some fights I work, a guy come to me, man, he's, yo, this guy, he saved me. You know, because I don't only, only train fighters, I'm also a, a cut man. So, you know, a guy, like, yo, see this man, see this cut, and he showed me a zipper scar. He's like, you remember when you stopped it, this cut, and I, I went on, I wanted to, uh, no, nah, not really. You know, he was so enthusiastic about it, must have been thumped a big, but I've worked so many fights. You know, like, they used to be at the Blue Horizon, and the shame they shut that down. We used to blue rising and, and might have 10 fights. I might work six six fights on one side of the car. You know, when I was coming up, that's how you learned your craft. They put you with the, you know, the old time they put you with the guy. You'd go on a B-side and you would work with all the B-side guys. And that's how you got your experience. You know, they brought in the lose and they get busted up and you stop the cut. You know, you give them some piece of advice and a lot of times you get upsets. You know? Yeah, you're you're working the wrong anybody, corner. Yeah, well, anybody Anybody can look good when you brought in at the house side and you brought in the win. But now if you could flip the script and find a way to get that guy that was brought in to lose to flip the script and win or to look very good when, they, you know, he wasn't supposed to, you know, it's, it's all experience. 
You know, when you when you when you're constantly behind the eight ball, you know you got to learn. You got to learn how to make them adjustments. That's what boxing is really about. If you think about it, boxing is a series of adjustments. Because everybody had a plan. You know, somebody oh, we we'll go out there, we're gonna box, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. But you know, the other guy had the plan too. But it, at the end of the day, when the person's plan isn't working, the one that can make the better adjustments between rounds, or sometimes in the middle of a round, gonna win the fight. What do you do? You feel like you see boxing like it slows down for that sixty seconds, or that you have an ability to be very concise and say things in the corner. What's like your an attribute that you think stands out in that that forty five second moment between rounds? Well, you can't give a guy a grocery list. You can't because by the time you give him a grocery list, he forgot half of what the fuck he said already. You know that's what a lot of green guys make the mistake. You know they give too much information. You see what your guy's doing good. You see what he's not doing good. You see what the other guy's doing, you know. And then you give him little bits of advice, you know. Bring, keep it simple. Keep it plain. You know, and keep it that way. Because if you give him too much, jab, slip, slide over, take the right hand, tie him up, spin him up. He forgot half of that shit before it came out your mouth. You know? As soon as it came out your mouth, he already forgot half of it. Just keep it simple. You know? The highest form of sophistication is simplicity. Keep it simple. You know? At the end of the day, all fights are basically the byproduct of the training camp in front of it. All the work should have been done in camp. All the work should have been done. Like, you know, and then I work off of a code system. I have codes that, that I work off of. Like, you know, if I call a code, you know, I stole that from Custom Model. Custom Model used to have a number system. Like 772, 772, you know, something like that. So his numbers will coincide with punches. So I would just have a code that might work off a, uh, a different move, like slip him to Mickey. I'm not talking about putting nothing in somebody's drink. I'm talking about throwing a hook up top to get him left his elbow and up to 45 to the lip. You know, like Mickey Ward, slip him to Mickey, you know? Something like that. No, that's... I, I remember uh, one coach once told me that he'd say one, two, and most people think that's jab, cross, but it was a completely different combination, hoping that the other fighter would assume that a jab, cross was coming. Well, it's like Sun Tzu said, all warfare is based on deception. If you could deceive him and make him believe it, you got him half beat. You know? I like that. What do you, When you're a cut man, what's the process going through an airport, getting your cut man supplies through? You got to check it in the bag, but otherwise they're going to give you problems. Ever had any I usually, issues? I usually, I, usually take, I usually take one of the bottles of uh, uh, adrenaline chloride with me. Because I got the prescription. I keep the prescription in my wallet. And it's one ounce of fluid. It's 30 milliliters, one ounce. So I'll take that through with me. Just in case my bags don't arrive, I got a bag of medicine. And I can improvise the rest. You know what I mean? I've, had to, I've done that a few times. You know what I mean? When your bag did come. So you, you know, you maybe you get a, a a spoon and you bend it and you put that in ice, you know, make that end swell. You get a, you know, you go, you get a, a powder sugar shaker. You know what I mean? You, Bound out the bottom of it a little bit with a boom handle, try to make it as round as possible. You fill that with ice. You know what I mean? No, I... Instead of an ice bag, you take Ziploc bags, boom. I would, you know, you, you just got to improvise. Instead of swabs, you know, you take like, you know, you, you can usually run to a supermarket, uh, 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 like a Rite Aid or a, a pharmacy, a CVS or something to grab certain things. And then you just improvise, you know? What about wrapping hands fight night? What's your tradition with hand wrapping or... How fast? We wrap an hour out. We usually wrap an hour out. No need to be more than that. Do you have any? Do you, when you're in the bigger fights, do you want to make sure someone's watching the other corner? Absolutely. And God, we trust everything else is suspect, right? I like that saying. It's true. You got to always put somebody in another corner. But you got to make sure your guy that's over there watching knows what the hell he's looking for. Do you prep you know, him? That's some guys that, huh? Do you prep him before he goes over there, or is it someone that you feel is like anybody a... with me? Anybody with me know the ins and outs. You know what I mean? Okay. I might just remind them what to look for, but that's it. They already know the ins and outs. I was once filming a guy once, and I remember the fighter that was getting wrapped they made him like they were making him the inspector look at every single wrap and he was going oh my god this is going to take an hour and 45 minutes to get my wraps on because they were just on him yeah well you know you got to man because some states they don't watch shit you know come back and slide something in there and do some dirty stuff to a fighter this sport this sport's dangerous enough as it is without people trying to cheat you know what i mean 
like loading wraps and, you know, skimming back the gloves and and walking on the gloves when the inspector's not around or, or you know, taking performing enhancement substances. You know, this this is dangerous enough as is. You don't you don't need to add to the uh, to the danger of this sport by trying to do scumbag moves. You know, I've always felt people should be tried for attempted murder if they're caught doing stuff like that. But that's just because I feel like that I don't would know rid about the sport. Murder, but they got they should get charged with something. You know how like they banned Panama Lewis. Panama said he didn't even do it. I don't know if he did or he didn't. You know, but he's got a lifetime ban. You see, some guys get away with shit and they're right back at it. Yeah, the last guy that got banned with that Capitilio when he when he was trying to rap uh, uh Margarito, right? And brother Nazem Coney. Yeah, yeah, that was that's the last incident ever. And now we got. I was just on a podcast and people were talking about Fury's glove or something, but I don't, I don't really see it with Fury's glove. I think that's just people being upset that he whooped they're on just Wilder. Upset that, they're, 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 their man got beat. Bottom line, the process of, of gloving up a fighter on the elite level, the odds of them trying to do something to that glove is, is, is almost, almost impossible. You have to remember, say, when you choose the glove, right after the weigh-ins, the fighters go for, to the glove table, right? And at the glove table, the commissioner, the representative for whatever sanctioning body they're fighting for, let's just say for argument's sake, the WPC, he's there. You got the state athletic commissioner there. You got a representative from the challenger's corner. You got a representative from the, maybe sometime two representatives from the challenger's corner, two representatives from, from at least one representative, you know, from the champion corner. And then they take out all the gloves that are in, in bags shipped by the manufacturer to, to prevent tampering so you can see if they've been tampered with, right? They're in factory sealed packaging. So they open them up, boom, they put them on the table. The, the challenger, the champion has his chance to choose his, his primary and the secondaries, and the and the uh, champion has his choice to choose the primary and secondary. They choose them. Then after they choose them, the challenger's corner has a chance to look at the champion's glove. The champion has a chance to look at the challenger glove. You know what I'm saying? They look at it, boom, they sign on the cuff at the bottom. You know, they put their initials, boom. Then they put them, you know, they put them back, they tie them together, and they take them. They stay with the State Athletic Commission into fight time. And then maybe like an hour, hour and a half before the fight, they bring you the gloves. They give them to the, the inspector that's inside the room. You know what I mean? They watch it wrap, boom. After you wrap, they sign off on it. Sometimes the WPC inspector, they're here to sign on it, you know. Then they watch you, you know, you have a, a representative from the from the other corner watching you wrap, and then you have, a, you know, vice versa, and then, you know, they watch you glove the man and, and tie him up. Then they put the tape and then they mark it. So, you know, the, you go to Boss Elite, the inspector goes with you. I mean, come on, man. How, how, how the hell are you going to put some kind of glove on halfway? And then not only that, here's the other thing. Then when you make it to the ring, the, the referee comes to the corner, right? And he inspects your gloves, right? So you're going to get past the inspector, you're going to get past the uh, WBC representative, you're going to get past the state inspector, you're going, to get, you're going to get past the other corners representative. Damn, you can do all that. I don't know. Probably should be a stockbroker if you could do that. Like You could the- do all that, man. I mean, you know, they're, 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 you know f- a casual fans think this, you know, they don't know everything that goes on behind the scenes. Ooh, the bills were flapping. Well, maybe he works on that. Maybe he uses like a dead wrist. You know, like you ever, you ever like played around when you was a kid and hit each other with dead hands? Yeah. Or maybe he does that. Maybe it's because, you know, the, the old timers had punches called dead weight shots. There's not too many people left to teach dead weight shots. I happen to because I was taught by the master. But, you know, there's very few people that understand the concept of dead weight shots. Maybe from dead weight shots. You know? Yeah. Who are the fighters right now that you look at and view as masters of their craft? Now, in today's time? In today's time. Well, Mayweather's retired now, but he was definitely a master of his craft. Um, Terrence Crawford, complete fighter. Very good. You know, good IQ, good ring generalship, good tools, fights on both sides. Um, Canelo, he's, he's a complete fighter. You know, they developed him very well. Um, Lomachenko, Usyk, um, I knew he and Ari out of Japan, little dude, punching holes with people. Very big puncher. Um, yeah. Legend, basically, in the making. You know, a lot of good fighters out there, you know. They're, they're, but those are the 
the one that come off my head. I know I'm missing a few. Then there's this kid out of Philadelphia, Boo Tennis. Tell me about him. There. Oh, man, he's a monster. He's, you know, his pop is probably, well, me and his pop go back a long time. He's a great, great teacher. His father the a great teacher. And um, he was a very good fighter, too. But he just stopped fighting because, you know, he did. Once again, like I was talking about maybe a half hour ago about bad management here in Philadelphia. He didn't have the right management. He could fight his ass off, but he didn't have the right management. And he wasn't going to let himself, you know, get get put in the wrong kind of fights. So he joined the union and uh, labor union, I think, and, and just, you know, started training fighters. And um, so he was still sparring with his fighters up to about like 10 years ago. And he was like 50, you know. Um, his son, he had uh, first son, Pooh, very good fighter. Uh, Derek Guinness, right? When I was in yeah, Philly, Derek, I met him. He was a very good fighter, very good fighter. Then his other son, Farah, my old man, strong, good puncher, real good fighter. And they both got to, you know, to the elite level, but they didn't get over that hump. But they got right to there. They got right to the door. They just didn't get in. And now Boots, you know, he's the third. He came along, you know, so he has a little bit of all three of them. You know what I mean? And, his, you know, he picked their brain, the box IQ. He grew up in the gym with these guys, so... He's seen the things that they did great, and he's seen the things that they did wrong. So, you know, he, he emulated the things that, he, that they did great, and he put his own twist on it. And he's seen the things they did wrong, and he did it right, you know. This kid's a monster. He'll, he'll be the real deal. It's just he's having, from what I understand, he's having uh, business problems out because his manager's suing his promoter or something along that line. But once he gets all that strained out, sky's the limit. Superstar. I, I remember him from the 2016 Olympic trials and it was him and gary russell gary antoine russell were hands down the two best in their division yeah they could fight it was just both. like those two were on a crash course for each other yeah but you gotta look they both come from from great boxing families they got the pedigree you know what i'm saying gary russell got like eight sons or something like that all named gary all could fight their ass off you know Bozy got like three sons all could fight their ass off so you know it's like you know it's a pedigree you know what I mean? They were bred to win. Everyone tells me when I talk to people about fighting boots that have sparred him that he just hits ridiculously hard. It's like he's Absolutely. fast, he hits hard, but he like they're they're like he's kind of a cheat code because most guys that hit hard, they can't think with you, or maybe they're a little slower. It's like he's fast, he hits hard, and he thinks. It's like it's almost unfair. Hey, it's a complete package, I'm telling you. He's got it made. Got it all. That's that's something because I was gonna ask you who are the prospects we should have on our radar, and I was gonna ask you about Boots, but that's great that you just brought him up on your own. Oh yeah, you can fight Boots. Boots is the man. He'll be champion in the world. It's all a matter of time. It's just the, it's just uh, like like we started this with. Anything worthwhile doesn't come in one overnight. day. Nah, it takes a lot of years to become an overnight sensation. When did you realize you had all this knowledge? Because it's like talking with you, I'm like, wow, you got a lot of knowledge. When did you? When did it click for you that you've obtained this much knowledge in fighting? Well, you know, I was blessed to be around a great teacher, like my mentor, the late great Mr. Wesley Mose. I'm like, I was so. When I was a kid, I might have been like 12 years old, and at this time, I think he was still training Dwight Muhammad Kawi, I think, or maybe at Tony Thorne. I don't remember who that kid was, who we had, but I asked him. You know, I said, Mr. West, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah. I said, how long it took you to learn everything to know about boxing? So he starts laughing. I thought, oh, I'm sorry. He said, no, but I'm not laughing at you. He said, I'm laughing that you think I know everything there is to know about boxing. I said, Mr. West, you know, you you, buy, you knocked down Bob Montgomery when he was a lightweight champion in the world and two rounds of non-title bout. You fought the great like William Joy. Everybody knows you won. You built Dwight Muhammad Kawi from a 1-1-1 one, one, one instant pro with no amateur background to the light heavyweight championship, cruiserweight championship, and then national box office. He said, Billy, hold on. Let me stop you right there. He said, I appreciate that you think highly of me, but let me let you know a little secret. You could be in this game 60 years, make 100 world champions, still learn something new. And he said the reverse side of that is you've been in this game 60 years, make 100 world champions, and there's still going to be somebody say, I don't know what the hell he's doing. Hate us. That's the way it is. So, you know, I always knew you can always learn something more. You always can, you know. The man who thinks you know everything got a lot to learn, you know. So I've always tried to learn. I still, you know, I have still, to this day, but I've been blessed. I've been, you know, I'm blessed to pick the brain of a lot of great teachers and, and cut men and things of that nature that were able to um, impart their knowledge onto me because they say a smart man learns from his mistakes, a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. You know? You must be a reader because you have so many good quotes. 
Oh yeah, I read a lot. You know, you got to exercise the mind. Train the mind, the body has no choice but to follow. What do you want to get from boxing when it's all said and done? I want to go down in the history books as one of the greatest that ever did it, not only for me, but to bring honor to my teachers, you know what I mean? To my, to my mentor, late great mentor, Wesley Mozart. I want people to, you know, when they be like, who's the best that ever did it? I want to be in that conversation. You know what I mean? God willing, you know, get in the International Box Hall of Fame while I'm still alive and well in my right frame of mind. And um, God willing, make a decent living, you know what I'm saying, for me and my family. What do you think it would take to get to that point? Do you have any check marks or just continue what you're doing and just keep teaching the knowledge that you know? Uh, you got to get the right, you got to get, you got to get, you got to get, I don't want to say lucky because I don't really believe in luck, but you got to get fortunate. You got to get fortunate and get the right horse, you know, the right horse, because there's been guys that, that and I don't like to disrespect anybody or, you know, try to downplay anybody, but there's been lesser guys that got lucky that grabbed on to a fighter that was so vastly talented he pulled them up, you know, and he they he elevated them to a level that they never really earned their stripes to be at. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's... Was... And then there's guys that are great teachers that unfortunately are dying on the vine because they just haven't had that right fighter. Me and Freddie Wilson were talking about this at the, at the wild card like two years ago when I was out there training guys. Because, you know, Freddie's a very good friend of mine. And we were talking about there's a lot of good trainers that are dying on the vine. You know, it's all in the horse that you ride, man, you know. It's all what you have on the stool because at the end of the day, you could be the greatest teacher in the world. If you don't have the guy on the stool that could pull it off, you know, the fighter makes the, 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 the teacher makes the fighter in the gym, but the fighter makes the teacher in the eyes of the public, you know? Well, I get what you're saying because I look at these amateur tournaments. I'm probably one of the few people in the country that follows amateur boxing outside of the people that have sons or gyms that have a member in it. And screw the amateurs up, man. The amateurs don't want as good as it used to be. Yeah, they're not. They're not. But I'm. What I'm saying is, I, how many times do I see a guy where he's probably not even really being coached, and he'll win a national tournament, and it kind of proves your point. Where if someone kind of attaches themselves to this kid from that hometown, they can rise up with that kid, Absolutely. even though they're probably doing cardio boxing, and they might put a little spin on it. But there's not a lot. It's more or less. This is a kid who is just tough as hell who could win fights at all levels, and he, he just does not want to lose. He's hyper-competitive. Well, see, unfortunately today, what, what horns boxing is, is the lack of teachers. There's only a handful of real teachers left in our beloved sport. There's a lot of trainers and a lot of gyms. There's very few teachers in school left. Very few. You know? Man, that is those are powerful words. What do you what is it about it? Is it that people want to be business owners, open a gym, and then they just want to kind of have fighters and train them and they don't want to Well, it's a, it's a lost art. See, what happened was a lot of the great trainers, excuse me, a lot of the great teachers, you know, they didn't have people that wanted to latch on and grab that knowledge and bring it into this generation. You know what I mean? Like in Philadelphia, we got a lot of great teachers. My mentor, like great mentor Wesley Mozart, in my opinion, was the best. You know? And I was able to, I was probably the last guy that latched on. Well, I know I was. I was the last guy that latched on that was able to have enough time with him to be able to, because I was with him for like 20 years, to be able, you know, to gather that knowledge and that craft and, and that insight, you know, and, and the little nuances and bring that with me, you know, and then gather my experience along the way, you know, and to be able to uh, implement what he told me, a lot of guys can do that. Like Georgie Benton was another tremendous trainer for Philadelphia. Most of his understudies were all from out of town because he was training guys for for uh, main events, Lou Duva and them for main events. So he had understudies that were uh, Tommy Brooks from San Diego, I believe he is, um, uh, Ronnie Shields from Houston, um, what's the the white fellow from India, I, I don't know, uh, Roger Bloodworth. You know, Roger Bloodworth. We had these guys, uh, Kenny Weldon, who just passed away, may rest in peace. Very good teacher. So, you know, all these guys were his understudy, so to speak. So by the time he came back to Philadelphia, he, you know, he, he wasn't really teaching people no more. And then he was older and, and, he, and, he, and, he, came, and he got sick, you know, may he rest in peace. The last guy that I know of that was his understudy in Philadelphia, a big Dwight triplet, which was a very good teacher, too. 
and he's unfortunately he got sick. I don't I don't I haven't heard from him in a while. I don't know if he passed away, but he's you know he's not training fighters anymore right now. What did you? Oh, Slim go ahead. Jim Robinson, Slim Jim Robinson from in Philadelphia. Like he was a lot of a lot of champions, but he was with Don King. He was like Don King's house trainer. You know what I mean? He's training most of Don King fighters out there in Orwell, Ohio. And um, he really didn't have any under, understudies. The only real understudy he had was actually his fighter, a terrible Tim Witherspoon, who's, you know, from here. And he's training guys, trying to pass on that knowledge. And then his son, you know, he trained his son, and now his son's trying to pass on that knowledge. So they come off of that lineage. And then you have, um, you know, Willie Rush. Yeah, a lot of good trainers, a lot of good teachers. But now there's not too many. And then the, the guys didn't really take time to latch on to bring that knowledge. So now you got a lot of guys that want to, be fancy with the pads, you know. We don't need fancy pad work guys. We need true teachers. There's only a few. Nobody wants to put in that time and study and earn their stripes and pay their dues. You know, you don't need boot camp and no no uh no sergeant major. You gotta earn your stripes. You know? So I'm gonna I'm gonna kinda see if I, I grasp the concept of this. Is Part of when you don't latch on to a lineage and a teaching system that you have to start from the ground up again and that you're like making the mistakes that those lineage made two generations ago. So you're just like generations behind a teaching system that has worked through decades ahead of what you're doing. To an extent, yes. I mean, you wouldn't have to start from scratch. If you really knew boxing, you would be able to you know, get into that lineage and you would understand and you would have that, you would have that knowledge base that you could build off of. You know what I mean? And you would be able to be able to do certain things. Because if you feel if you're fundamentally sound, see, like we talked about earlier, it all goes back to being fundamentally sound. I asked my mentor years ago, my rest in peace, I said, what's the difference between a good fighter and a great fighter? He said, one of the major difference between a good fighter and a great fighter is a great fighter takes time to master the fundamentals. One of the other major difference between a good fighter and a great fighter is a good fighter can make adjustments from fight to fight, where a great fighter can make adjustments from round to round, and sometimes in the middle of a round, which if you think about it, all goes back to being fundamentally sound. So if you're fundamentally sound, you'll be able to pick it up and move forward. But you, you, you won't have, you know, you need to have that, that, that knowledge base that you can draw from, you know, like you got to ask questions because the only, the only dumb question is one that's never been asked. You know what I mean? You got to, you got to ask these questions. Okay. Why would you do this? Because many people know the how, if you know the why, the key is in the why. A lot of guys can show you how, but they can't show you the why and the why not and the when and the when not, you know? Well, I think in boxing, why is the biggest word, right? Because for a fighter, I always think about what's your why? Why are you going to be a champion? Why are you sacrificing so much? And for a coach, like you just said, it's like, why are you training this way? Why no, is no, this no. method? Why I'm referring to the why you do things. Like anybody can show you what, how to jab or why do you jab? When do you jab? When don't you jab? Why do you throw the right hand? When do you throw the right hand? When don't you throw the right hand? That's the why I'm referring to. You know what I mean? No, I get, I get many, what you're saying. Many people can show you the how. They just can't show you the why. Because they don't know. You know? Most people do things for one of two reasons, either out of, you know, out of not caring or out of ignorance. So if a guy's taking the time to train a fighter, obviously he has some form of caring. So he's doing out of ignorance, not knowing. He got to know, you know? Man, this is a, you're a wealth of knowledge for uh, boxing, man. Thank you. For more great shows, please go to iTunes or wherever podcasts are found and leave us a review.